this chapter tells you about the parts of the cell, the bacterial cell. When you took anatomy and physiology, you learned about the parts of the human cell. And there are some things that are in common. So, for example, all cells, whether it's human, plant, bacteria, fungus, have to have a few things. All cells have some sort of shape, and we already talked about all the weird shapes that bacteria can have. All cells have to have the cytoplasm. Remember, the cytoplasm is like that jelly-like stuff in the cell. All cells have some sort of membrane, which we call the cell membrane or the plasma membrane that surrounds the cytoplasm. And all cells have to have DNA, the genetic material. All cells have ribosomes. This is where proteins are made, and all cells need proteins, so they all have to have that. All cells need to do all of these basic things. We all have to somehow reproduce. Like I said, we all have DNA. We all have to be able to grow. All cells need to be able to respond, transport, and have some sort of metabolism. All bacteria have that membrane I told you about, the cell membrane. We'll put a star because they all have it. All bacteria have the DNA. Now, bacteria don't have a nucleus, so their DNA kind of just bunches up in the middle of the cell. This is the chromosome. Remember that uh, humans have 46 chromosomes. Most bacteria only have one, and it's just kind of bunched up in the middle. There's no nucleus, but we call this a nucleoid. So we'll put a star there because all bacteria have the chromosome. This is the DNA, the genetic material. And then the other thing all bacteria have are the ribosomes, which are scattered throughout the cell. We'll put a star because they all have them. There are some extra things that some bacteria have. Some bacteria have flagella that allows them to move, swim, but not all bacteria have it, only some. Some bacteria have an extra coating around them. It's like an extra layer of protection. It's called a glycocalyx. This is kind of like a sticky coating, kind of like a how you know how the M&Ms have those extra shell around them, that like nice sugary shell. That's what the glycocalyx is, like an M&M shell. But not all bacteria have them. Only some. Some bacteria have these little hair-like things that all around them. And these little hair-like things, they could be one of two things. They could either be pili or they could be fimbriae. Some bacteria have both. Some bacteria only have one or the other. Now, write this down because everybody gets this confused all the time. Bacteria do not, they do not have cilia. <laughs> cilia is that stuff you have in your throat. Remember you have those on lining your respiratory tract? Those are not something bacteria have. So bacteria have pili or fimbriae. They do not have cilia. So don't get that one confused. So those are the parts of the bacterial cell. I'm going to start on the outside and work my way in. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in this lecture. We're going to start on the outside. Flagella. So the purpose of the flagella, like we said before, is they allow for movement. There's three main parts of the flagella. The part that anchors, this part here, it anchors the flagella into the cell wall. This is called the basal body. Then as you go out of the cell, there's a little part here that goes out. This is called the hook. And then there's a, the tail. The, this goes really long, the actual tail part. This is made out of a protein. And this part is called the filament. So those are the three parts, basal body, hook, filament. They can't just swim in a straight line. Instead, they do something called a run and tumble. So this guy in the middle here, he's doing a tumble right now. And they do the tumble so they can like kind of gain momentum. And then they're going to shoot off and for the run. And this guy, that guy was doing a run. You saw him just like swimming. So when they're going like that, that's a run. And when they're like that, that's a tumble. And that's how bacteria move. Now, some bacteria, they have just one flagella like this guy. If there's just one flagella, it's called monotrichus. If there's a bunch of flagella on the end, but there's a whole bunch of them just on one end, it's lophotrichus. If the bacteria has flagella at both ends, well, this one is called 
amphitrichus. And then my favorite is if there's flagella all over the cell. That is peritrichus. Anytime you see peri, that means many. When you want to go somewhere, you call an Uber, right? Before there was Uber, a long time ago, there used to be something called a taxi. So taxi means to move. And that's what a taxi does. It moves you from one place to another. When bacteria want to move toward a chemical or a food source, they do something called chemotaxis. And the chemical could be a sugar. It doesn't have to be like something bad. Some bacteria, they need sunlight. So they do something called phototaxis, which means to move toward light. There's many other types of taxis, but this is just the two main the two main types. Whenever you see a spirochete, spirochetes have very unique flagella called periplasmic flagella. And what that means is their flagella are not just on one end or the other. They kind of wrap around the cell. So the flagella are like all over the body. Oh, here's a picture. So here's the spirochete. The flagella are the yellow thing that wraps around them. Now let me give you an example of a spirochete. Have you ever heard of Lyme disease? I'm sure you have, right? It's spread by the tick. Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria called Borrelia. And Borrelia are spirochetes. Another one is syphilis. Syphilis is an STD. It's spread by a bacteria called Treponema. It's also a spirochete. Spirochetes like to kind of, uh, you can kind of see it. They have these corkscrew shapes, so they kind of move like a corkscrew would. Like if you were opening a bottle of wine, that's how the periplasmic flagella works. So something like Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease, or syphilis, uh, treponema, those uh, bacteria, they can like almost like screw their way into joints or into neural tissue using that periplasmic flagella. So those are really unique and really cool. Remember I said some bacteria have these little hair-like things on the outside. These are called fimbriae. Fimbriae are made up of protein. These are made up of protein. These are used for sticking or attaching. I always say sticking, but I guess the proper word would be attaching or adhering. So you could probably think about a lot of things that cause disease, like E. coli needs to stick to your intestines, right? So e. Coli, this is actually a picture of E. coli sticking to your microvilli. Or streptococcus in your throat, strep throat needs to stick in the throat. Or on your teeth, like your teeth, some of the bacteria might have fimbriae and they attach there. So they use these bristles to stick to surfaces. Pili are different than fimbriae, but a lot of people use the name inter interchangeably. Pili do two main things. Pili could also be used for movement, just like, not like flagella, but there's more like a, like a walking movement. Imagine uh, the, the bacteria is like stuck on a surface and it's going to use its small little pili legs to walk. Could be used for movement, but more importantly, pili are used to attach one cell to another cell. They form these like extensions between cells. And when they do this, these are a special type of pili called the sex pili. That's actually what they're called. What they do is they actually can exchange genetic material between each other. So this cell could give genetic material to this one. So sex pili is used for the exchange of DNA. And whenever a bacteria exchanges DNA like this, it's a special process called conjugation. Conjugation is the exchange of DNA. Now, I bet you could think of somewhere where this could be really dangerous. Where this is really dangerous is in the spread of antibiotic resistance genes, spread of antibiotic resistance. If one pathogen was resistant to something, it could spread that gene to another. And that's how antibiotic resistance spreads from diff to different organisms, is through conjugation. So that's a pill eye. Okay, remember the last thing, green thing I wrote here, glycocalyx. And I said that was like a sticky coating like the M&M shell. It's used for like cells to stick to each other and to surfaces. The glycocalyx, it's made up of sugar 
and protein. The sugar is what makes it really sticky. The protein is what makes it really sturdy. There's two types of glycocalyx. The first one is called a slime layer. Remember like uh, when you were a kid and you watched people get slimed like on Nickelodeon? <laughs> That's what the slime layer is like. It's kind of like this goopy, loosely organized, but very sticky material. The other type of glycocalyx is called the capsule. Capsules, just like it sounds, like when you have a Tylenol or a medication that has a capsule, it's nice and smooth, but it's pretty firm, but it still could get sticky. That's exactly what the capsule and bacteria is like. Now, what bacteria use these for, these uh, slime layer or the capsule, is to form something called a biofilm. Let me show you a picture. This is a picture from a urinary catheter, which I'm sure you can imagine. If somebody's not properly cleaning the catheter, it, if it gets infected, bacteria will start growing. So let's say this is the surface of the catheter. This could be a catheter. This could be your own teeth. Teeth are very susceptible to biofilms. This could be your shower head your toilet, whatever, okay, pipes, bacteria like pipes. Here's what happens, okay, it starts out a few bacteria might stick onto the surface, but then they start that slime layer on the outside. Now, other bacteria can come in, start sticking too. Eventually, they're going to form this, you know, this big multi-layers of bacteria. More bacteria are going to come in. All right, and this is what a biofilm is, biofilm. Many layers, it's layers of microbes that are kind of all stuck together. And as you can imagine, it's very difficult to get rid of the biofilm. If somebody had most infections, most internal infections in, in a human being are due to a biofilm. Like if somebody were to take antibiotics, or if you were to try to clean this biofilm off of your uh, your shower or whatever, you might be able to kill off a few on the outside, but these ones on the inside are really protected because they're, there's layers of them, they're really sticky, power in numbers there. Biofilms can cause a lot of problems, not only for human health, infections, your teeth, right? If you don't brush your teeth and there's sugar on your teeth, biofilms start growing, it forms plaque, even like your, you know, your toilet, your refrigerator, biofilms will grow there. So that's why these uh, glycocalyx are so important. The other thing, other than being sticky, the other thing about the capsule, what makes them also particularly dangerous, like some of the most deadliest diseases caused by bacteria that produce a capsule. Because in your body, you have white blood cells called phagocytes. Those are those white blood cells their job is to uh, attack and destroy pathogens. But capsules make it so that phagocytes can't recognize the bacteria. So capsules allow the bacteria to hide or evade from phagocytes so that they don't get destroyed. So glycocalyx, this is something that makes a bacteria more pathogenic. Now we've learned about all of those things on the outside of the cell, the flagella, the glycocalyx, fimbriae, pili. It's time to start going into the cell, to the, to the membrane area. Let's talk about the cell membrane, which you've seen before, but you need a refresher, right? The purpose of the cell membrane is it has what's called selective permeability. It allows certain things in and out of the cell, but very selective, right? You don't want any toxins getting in the cell. You don't want your cell to lose all of its nutrients. So it selectively allows things in and out. That's the job of the cell membrane. Cell membrane is made up of two main components. You have these phosphate. These are phosphate. Phosphate heads. Now remember, the phosphate heads will line up all together facing the outside of the cell. So the outside of the cell is here, outside of cell. And there will be some that face the inside of the cell because the phosphate heads are hydrophilic, which means they are attracted to water. They're okay with water. We'll just say they love water. Now attached to the phosphate heads, you know what's coming, 
there's little tails, like a lollipop with two sticks. All right, now these tails are made up of fats. They're made up of lipids. They're the lipid tails. And they face each other inward in the membrane because the membrane is a bilayer. There's two layers to it. So the lipid tails are hydrophobic. They do not like water. That's why they face each other inward. Now the other thing the membrane has is there's some proteins. Sometimes the proteins expand all the way through the membrane. So this could be a protein that goes from the outside all the way to the inside. Sometimes the protein only goes halfway. And there could be some uh, carbohydrates in the membrane too. There could be some carbs. There could be some cholesterol. So there's many different things kind of poking around in the membrane. But these proteins and carbs and things like that, they don't just stay in one place. These things are constantly moving around. So we call this a fluid mosaic. The membrane is a fluid mosaic, which means the proteins and the carbs are constantly floating around throughout the membrane. Nothing in the membrane is stationary. This is a prettier picture, okay? So you can see the phospholipid bilayer here. You can see different transport proteins and glycolipids and carbs, but they don't just stay in one place. They're constantly moving throughout the membrane. And as, as I mentioned, this is called the fluid mosaic model.